So welcome everyone. Welcome to uh, Body Talk, Voice and Movement in Pre-Modern Literature with uh, ACMRS short-term residents, Dr. Olani Hicks-Bartlett and Dr. Elisa O. Oh. We are thrilled to have them with us today. Um, their impressive bios are available on the event registration page, which you, we are going to drop in the chat now so you all can look through. Uh, I don't want to take up their time by reading their extensive and impressive bios. So you should, please take a look at those. Um, so just a little bit about our short-term residency program uh, before we begin, as they are our two short-term residents this year. Uh, this program supports early and mid-career scholars in their research, uh, and it's a residency that's unique in so far as it's flexible. So scholars receive a stipend of 7500 and they may visit ASU for any length of time that would be most useful to, uh, to them and to their projects. So you can find more information about the short-term residencies on our website, and that link is also going in the chat now, so you can take a look at it. Um, so a bit of, of housekeeping. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind you all that this event is being recorded and will be available on our ACMRS YouTube channel in the coming weeks. If for any reason you do not want to be in that recording, please keep your camera off throughout. And uh, finally, please keep your mic muted during the presentation. We'll have about 30 minutes of conversation and then we'll have time afterwards for questions and dialogue. Um, so without further ado, I wanna welcome our two brilliant guests, Alani and Elisa. And I will just say beyond their impressive scholarship, um, they are two of the kindest and most gracious people I know. We're lucky to have them in our field and in our community. So uh, it's really, really my pleasure to welcome them today and looking forward to this talk. Oh my goodness. Um, thank you so much, Ruben. That was very kind of you. And uh, we just wanted to begin by saying how much we appreciate the support and we wanted to thank um, ACMRS for this platform in the first place and for just the really wonderful experience that being uh, short term fellows has been for both of us. Um, and we just, you know, appreciate the, the the fantastic programming and conferences um, through Race Before Race, ACMRS, and at ASU. And we just specifically wanted to thank all of you at ACMRS for having this opportunity to have this conversation about our work. And then finally, to everyone who's zooming in uh, to the conversation and uh, joining us in this space, like, thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, and I will hand things over to Elisa in a second, but we also just wanted to briefly address the title that we selected when we were thinking through kind of different ways to frame our conversation today. And we were looking for something that rang true to both of us and that provided a certain bridge or, you know, kind of pointed to the common ground that brings our interests and work together, which is why we were thinking about bodies and talking, thus, you know, the body talk aspect of it. Uh, so we were just kind of considering um, that those were the like likely the major ways in which our work on dance, gender, race, marriage, disability studies intersects. And this is, you know, this reminded us of a book that was published some 30 years ago out of UPenn by E. Jane Burns, which is called Body Talk, When Women Speak in Old French Literature. And so just to provide a really little bit of context for that, we wanted to say that Burns's book draws on some of her earlier work on systems of knowledge. Uh, she has a key article that was published ahead of this book called Knowing Women. So it's discussing knowledge and female orifices in medieval literature. And when she published that book, she had already done quite a bit of work on speech and conversation and on talking back in particular and on the various ways in which women respond, be they protagonists or or secondary characters and how they manage discourse more broadly speaking. Um, so we were thinking that given Elisa's really wonderful, capacious and extensive work on embodied movement, particularly as seen through dance and choreography and the strategies that are involved in like political alliances and marriage, as well as her work on silence and given my work on silence and intertextual echoes and citationality and on gender and violence and marital violence in particular, that Burns's work, which we both appreciate but also have critiques of, was just kind of a useful, compelling uh, springboard for discussion for us both. Um, so did I did I get that right, Elisa? And I, I'd love to ask you um, there... how you feel that body talk understood broadly, or how giving frozen. critical Am priority. What's that? Um, Can you hear me? Am Elisa? I the one who's frozen? I think you're frozen. 
Am I frozen? There you are. No, no. I think it was Elisa just for a second, but uh, oh no, <laughs> freezing again. Elisa, are you there? I suspect Alicia. you might jump back in. Hi. <laughs> we'll spotlight you. Hi, Elisa. I was just going to ask you. I hope you, can, I hope you can hear me now. I was just going to ask how you feel that um, body talk kind of understood broadly or how giving critical priority to bodies and their movement and speech inform your kind of intellectual priorities and how that informs your work, both in terms of your research and the classroom. Oh, yes, absolutely. I'm sorry. Um, I just had a little crash of the Zoom for some one second, but I'm back. And thank you, ACMRS, for having us, for hosting this, for lifting us up with the, you know, material and immaterial support for our projects. This has just been such an honor. Um, it's also always a pleasure because um, every single person um, that, I, you know, that we interact with through ACMRS has been tremendously supportive. So we can, I think Alani and I can only um, highly recommend that everyone apply for their fellowships. Um, and thank you, Ruben, for the introduction. And thank you, Jeff, and everyone who has made this happen. So I'm sorry, I feel very <laughs> like I left you and then I came back. But thank you for that amazing opening, Alani, on Body Talk. I'm so pleased. We have just found so many ways that our work overlaps and, and intersects. And then this is just one of them. Um, I feel like J. E. Jane Burns' uh, book, Body Talk, really models um, a critical stance um, and practice that I admire very much. Um, I think her work prompts us to reevaluate female characters and really by extension, other marginalized subjects in pre-modern literature, particularly pre-modern literature by men, and also to attend, the, attend to the way that their bodies participate in the dominant discourse and challenge it at different moments, um, regardless of whether we have a speaking or a writing subject or not. So um, Burns shows us how to be radical within the text um, and also not to accept single or superficial interpretations, say of a silent woman's body. Um, so I'm, I, I, I enjoyed returning to this with Alani because, um, because I'm, I was, re-impressed <laughs> with the importance of, um, of returning to contradictory representations of bodies, whether or not they're speaking, such as Philomena's weaving, moving, speaking hands, um, Isut's wink. There's a winking moment that I'm so glad that I reread, you know, the, the seeing and not seeing, the hiding and the revealing at the same time, just through this, um, this female character's body. Um, and pedagogically, I like to think of um, encouraging students to think through the bodies that we're in, um, not to imagine um, that we must speak or write or engage with literature through some disembodied um, or imaginary <laughs> um, white subject that we may have been trained to do. So, um, so I, I hope to be in constant dialogue with um, students, with the, the, the texts that I work on, um, and just to be sure to engage with these pre-modern texts. Um, through our lived and embodied and uh, intersectional selves today. Um, so I want to toss this back to Alani actually and ask you to say more about body talk and maybe even a little bit about um, your pedagogical priorities too. Yeah, sure. Thanks so much uh, for that for that question. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, in many ways, I've always tried to center bodies and speech in my classes also, in, in many of the ways that you you kind of delineated also. So I'll, I'll skip to maybe, you know, some, some other areas, but I, I found it to be a really useful springboard for so many um, historicized discussions of gender, race, and disability in particular, but you know it also opens up such a use, such useful avenues for contemporary critical debates as well. And so, focusing on how bodies are seen or not, and how they 
like negotiate or manage the space that they're in, um, the words that they use and so on. And I think, you know, giving attention to this kind of corporeal discourse is hugely productive. And at least it's it's been so in my classes, especially kind of mitigating students who come in with maybe different a different skill set or different languages or different expertise in, in different periods. Um, and so I recently taught a few classes through this lens. Um, one was um, race and gender in early modern tragedy. Another was on uh, pre-modern disability studies, and another was on um, like race and political power in medieval literature. And so for all of these uh, body talk and the ways that bodies circulate, which I, I thought was really interesting in how it kind of dialogues with your work on dance, you know, just these these strategies for choreography and how bodies were seen or were represented was always at the I, I try to make it always at the you know prioritized uh, pedagogical core of what I have been covering with my students. Um, and as regards Burns's book, you know, I thought what is really effective about Body Talk too is, or, or maybe partially a critique of it also is that it's precisely not just the corporeal or the linguistic, but you know both at the same time, and also so much more. And so even considering this absence of movement or the absence of communication um, are really interesting to me too. And so I've been looking at body talk through the lens of positionality, medical humanities and disability studies, and you know, thinking kind of, of Sara Ahmed's queer phenomenology and how bodies are oriented towards or around or against certain targets or how they're oriented in and of themselves. And then body talk as informed by disability studies, given the emphasis that Rosemary uh, Garland Thompson, just to give one example, puts on the communicative exchange and what she calls this kind of highly charged interpersonal encounter that's involved with like sight and staring. And, you know, staring is underscoring this, you know, a, a type of vivid form of, his, uh, of human communication, I think she calls it, where, you know, the starer is processing knowledge and making trying to make sense of the inexplicable. So in that sense too, you know, what a body communicates to another and how, how that body is seen, you know, triggers a dynamic that's ensued and replicated and reproduced in, in many different ways. Absolutely. I love how um, this is that Burns book is an invitation to engage with um, the, the bodies that may be the least powerful within the text. Um, but to engage with them in a way that that looks for that goes looking and expecting to find meaning there. But while you have started this on this um, subject, I want to ask you to actually continue a little bit on methodology. Um, I'm very anxious to hear um, what you have to say about your work in in this sort of broader sense of working across medieval and early modern, at least as you know, we have traditional um, notions of periodization. And um, I don't know if you wanna talk about any reasons for that or things that are made possible by that choice. Um, <laughs> sure. Or even, yeah. or even the yeah. fact that you work across many languages too. I mean, this is all, um, of what, you know, so you, you just transcend our notion of where the boundaries no. should be. And I, I love to hear about why. <laughs> oh, well, thank, that's a very uh, generous question. Thank you so much. But yeah, no, I mean, I think, I think there are so many different ways of kind of going back to positionality and phenomenology, but there are so many different ways to approach a subject. And for me, particularly, I just found that, you know, instead of you know, really thinking about what is medieval versus what is early modern or what is, you know, this a text written in Spanish language when Spanish language is, you know, in dialogue with Portuguese, Italian, Latin, French, all at the same time. I mean, I just found personally that that was an approach that for me was really generative. Um, and it's been interesting, you know, I'm now in a comparative, one of my departments is a comparative literature department. So I'm called to make comparative gestures in a way that I think is, you know, I, I maybe don't inherently do that, even though I'm trying, you know, I, I, I have been trying to work pretty evenly across the different languages. But I just think it's um, a useful uh a useful, capacious, I suppose, I already said that word, but a capacious lens to um, approach things uh, for and kind of seeing how they change 
over time and seeing how the transition between you know one language to another kind of is also replicated in the texts has been a uh, really generative uh, for me. Um, well, just seeing and, the way our work intersects um, yeah. shows me how much can be gained from comparative work, um, most certainly. Um, so, so yeah, you, abso absolutely. You I was. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I think I'm talking over you a little bit, but I was just agreeing that, you know, yeah, I, I absolutely see, see, was thinking about that when we were, when we were reading each other's articles and things like that. But um, I guess along those lines, I'd love to hear methodologically too, you know, if you could talk a little bit about your primary, primary research, you know, interest and, and, and your book project and how that, you know, reflects what you're invested in in terms of bodies and speech. Yeah, so I am so much more constrained in my time period and culture. Um, so I focus on early modern English literature and I would say that's roughly um, 1530s to the 1670s. 80s. Um, <laughs> well, I um, will have to define the end and start and end dates more clearly, but my uh, book project is called Choreographies of Race and Gender, um, Dance, Ritual, and Travel in Early Modern Literature. And so I want to juxtapose those notions that we have um, of patterns of movement and hopefully challenge myself and my readers someday to um, be able to use the language of dance to talk about other types of social movement, other patterns of social movement of embodied um, human beings moving through space. And so, um, so I, I'm primarily interested in using the term choreography um, to be more broad than just simply a reference to a written um, description of a dance. So I would like to use um, choreography to denote um, the way that, or to, to denote the way that we move through patterns of um, physical movement to create um, power relationships, to create aspects of our identity, to, um, to figure out who we are and what stories we're telling to ourselves about the way we fit into a specific um, social group. So, um, so I think this term can be useful in the way it helps us theorize patterns of physical movement. Um, but it also, uh, for me, helps to talk about and in a way understand the workings of ideology. Um, I know we have a really typical metaphor, I guess you could say, for the way ideology works, which is interpolation, which comes from aple, which is to call or be hailed. Someone calls you, you know, Louis Althusser says, um, you know, you get called, hey, you, come on in, <laughs> and you get um, called by ideology. So that's a, that's a hearing metaphor, but I'd love to be able to talk about the way that ideology can also work in a kinetic way. So it doesn't, it, it can transcend language um, and it also um, can be acquired and you can, you know, you can become a part of it in a variety of ways. So you can absorb it passively or without at least being conscious of it, you know, from the way that you observe it around you from the time of birth, but you can also be taught how to move in good and bad ways, um, as anyone who has seen or taken a dance class will know. Um, and you can also be coerced. You can also be forced into patterns of movement that, um, that form who you are and how you identify yourself in relation to those who are pushing you through those movements um, in terms of servitude or relation uh, positionality uh, in society. So, um, so I'm hoping to be able to align um, things like a church liturgy where uh, Althusser will tell you that you will kneel first and then you will believe. Um, and then um, a dance as we understand a social dance um, such as in a court mask and um, perhaps imagined witchcraft ceremonies um, and then even colonial encounters um, in travel narratives where an English traveler is having a kinetic negotiation uh, regarding power relationships uh, with a person from a culture outside of Europe who does not share that same kinetic discourse. And of course, discourse comes from dis and carere. So that, that notion of running to and fro is kind of built in there. Um, so, but I, I, 
I think this connects right up to your sense of gender and power relationships, you know, relationships um, that that you bring us to through the notion of citationality and intertextuality. So could you um, maybe speak a little to this? Um, I, I feel like you make this provocative claim in your essay that is entitled Productive Citationality and Gendered Renegotiation. So that, that concept of negotiation, you know, um, in uh, the Remo of Francesco Petrarca and Gaspara Stampa. And so in this essay, um, Laura's body is mostly absent um, from Petrarch's text, but Stampa's body is a constant sense of knowing uh, for her text. And so as we see in Body Talk, um, we're prompted uh, to ask how we read and evaluate women's citations of their own bodies as authoritative. Um, so could you say more about uh, this in relation to Stampa's work and how citation can be used to change the model and change the tradition, um, maybe even change the reception of that source that is being cited? Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks for that uh, question. I mean, um, what I was looking at in particular, I mean, I'm, I'm very invested in Petrarch, in, in Petrarch's poetry, and then in early modern Petrarchan poets who are working in a Petrarchan, in a Petrarchan style. And we have a different consideration when we're dealing with male Petrarchan poets and, and, and a poet such as Luis Labe or Gaspar. Restampa or Isabella di Mora. Um, and so, you know, I was thinking about Judith Butler's answer to Jacques Derrida's analysis of citationality and iterability and, you know, just like the importance of performativity to language and identity and how that helps us understand these kind of authorial challenges, especially for a woman poet writing in a tradition that has, you know, that, that has this kind of fraught legacy where Lauda's body, I mean, I, I don't know if I would say that it's necessarily absent, but you know, it's it's this fragmentation that happens throughout. So, you know, she's described continually in these fragmented parts. Um, we see only a glimpse of her hair or a strand of her hair, part of her elbow, you know, a foot, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a beautiful um, a poem in which even her name is treated in this very fragmentary, fragmentary way. So in the Italian, Petrarch is saying like laudare to just con connote like lau from lauda and things like that. And it it repeats in that fragmentary way throughout the sonnet. So, you know, Gaspar Stampa is dealing with all of these kind of cit uh, citational challenges as a female poet writing in the Petrarchan mode after Petrarch. And I mean, obviously, Gilbert and Gubar, there's so many authors who have kind of talked about this, especially in maybe in, in as regards more contemporary uh, liter literature, like Virginia Woolf and et cetera, like authors such as that. But I, I really think that, you know, the centering that both Louise Labbé and Gaspar Stampa do of their own bodies in their own in their own poetry is 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 something that is really actively and very dynamically reworking uh, the Petrarchan tradition. Gaspar Stamp, I think, sometimes gets a little bit of short shrift because many of her early poems are so close to the Petrarchan model. Um, you know, Petrarch's first poem is "Voi che ascoltate in rime sparse," you all who hear in scattered rhymes. Gaspar Stampa's is. Um, Voi cascoltate in queste mesterime, you all who hear in these sad rhymes. So I mean, even even there, there's just such a similarity that sometimes she's just seen as a mere imitator of Petrarch, where really she's centering her body. Her body is so dynamic that it kind of gives birth. There's a metaphor. There's a sonnet that metaphorizes kind of giving birth and giving creational agency even to the body of her beloved. So it's a really it's a really different. Um, Kind of communicative uh, relationship between the poet, the suffering poet who is is you know is loving, um, and then the object that is refusing the love or 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 flying away from the love. And even on that level, I think it's another way in which I think so much about both uh, Garland Thompson's work and uh, Ahmed's Ahmed's work as, as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I wonder if there's any sense of uh, remembering 
the body that has been uh, dismembered by the original Petrarchan tradition when you have a woman writer who comes along and takes that uh, first person perspective and um, says that that fragmented woman is actually all in one place. It's all here and um, is speaking a co is sort of owning the discourse and directing it um, from yeah. sight of her own body. Yeah, thank you. And I mean, re remembrare this verb to remember. I mean, it literally depends on kind of bodily fragmentation again, and like also remembering. So yeah, that's a super, um, a super helpful comment. And I don't know, I guess, <laughs> kind of along these lines, or just thinking about, you know, authorial voice and ectantial speech and how that's managed, but I suppose in a macabre sense, how that also deals with fragmented bodies. Uh, this made, this is kind of making me think of your work on, on Macbeth and, and the witches, particularly since both speech and motion and kind of controlling bodies are at the forefront there. So, um, yeah, would, would you like to um, tell me how that uh, manifests itself in, in, in Macbeth? I'm thinking like particularly about movement, like circulation with travel and ritual and things along those lines. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I just um, would love to, I could talk about, I would love to talk about witch dances <laughs> all day. It sounds like such a sensational topic, but um, it actually, um, the movements, if you, you know, if you focus in on a play or on, you know, say female bodies um, in a play, um, and then you sort of tell yourself that we're going to look at if their movements more, you know, more than we're gonna look at the words even um, and just kind of trace those patterns that they uh, perform on stage. Um, it's really interesting to see the way that they take other patterns of movement or other choreographies that are already significant, that are already uh, meaningful. You could say that they cite them. I mean, your ideas about citationality have me thinking about the way that an audience in early modern England is gonna watch witches on stage and see kinetic echoes of mm. say a mass or of certain things that they might have done in a church service. So a liturgy for baptism involves a certain number of people <laughs> circling around this vessel. Um, and then what you're performing is a kinetic, um, powerful transformation. Um, from, you know, for say there's a child who is not yet a member of the church, but is going to be named into that identity. Um, and that involves circling around the font. And so, um, so if we see these witches circling around, around cauldron, there are these echoes that would be felt in a way in another time and place that we no longer necessarily do as audiences today. But, um, but the witches do practice um, the different kinds of movement or do embody the type, the, the kinetic patterns that I was talking about in that they dance, of course, um, and perform the ritual, the dancing and ritual um, go hand in hand. They talk about going around and around the cauldron, but they talk about switching direction with the circle. Mm -hmm. And of course that's considered demonic <laughs> to go counterclockwise, beware you all who dare to circle to the sinister and left-hand side. That is not the way <laughs> you are meant to circle around anything sacred. So, um, so they're, they're rituals in which they do these binding ceremonies with Satan, or they do, um, they evoke their spirit servants to do um, the fortune telling, involve these profane versions, um, really uncanny and disturbing versions of kinetic patterns that are pre-existing. Pre and so they also do um, movements of travel that are notable in their um, repeated quality. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I would love to talk at some point about uh, um, all the ingredients that they have. I think about um, essentially what they, where they had to go to do their, their repeated shopping trips. <laughs> um, they are, I mean, as we all um, trace repeated movements that kind of define who we are um, and you know, our repeated trips to work, to you know, wherever it is that we go to, to shop, to go to church, to go to friends' houses, um, those are patterns that, that create an identity for us. And so they, 
um, make trips to Aleppo. They make trips to um, obtain ingredients that came from Turkey, that came from Egypt, that came from all around the Mediterranean. So, um, so those things too also construct them and as strange or strangers in their movements and um, also raced as other than English or Scottish, shall we say, witches. Mm -hmm. um, but I, um, I actually cannot wait to hear about um, the sort of, you know, so one thing about dancing and about trying to track or even attend to, um, you know, to pay attention to movement is that it, it goes away. It's evanescent, right? It doesn't stay put like a tax does. Um, and when you talk about soundscapes, um, that shares that element of ephemerality. So, um, so I wanted to um, actually ask you to talk about um, this Calderon play, El Medico um, de su honra. And so um, the way you talk about soundscapes and the ontology of silence in this play is really, really inspiring to me. I find it is un unendingly <laughs> fascinating to talk about female silences in drama. But um, for those of you who, like me, <laughs> are not familiar with the 1635 play, um, it's translated as the doctor of his of his own honor. So it's the doctor of his honor. Um, it features features a doctor, um, um, Don Gutierrez. Am I correct? Me. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. Um, who develops an obsession, obsessive jealousy of his faithful wife, Doña Mencia, and her former love interest, Enrique. So Gutierrez arranges an honor killing of Mencia. Um, and he does this by hiring a blood letter to bleed her until she dies. Um, and so <laughs> within this play, um, there are, you know, you evoke these chaotic cries, um, dysfunctional speech, um, and all these sounds that don't function properly as linguistic markers. And so, um, so you talk about the representation of gendered linguistic dynamics and also the struggle for linguistic power and control in the play in the ways that language just doesn't work, especially for the female characters. So I would love it if you could correct me about the play <laughs> as needed, <laughs> and then also move on to talk about failures of language in it. Yeah, no, I guess I could just maybe contextually say that, you know, this uh, piece, The Doctor of His Honor, The Medico de Su Honra, can kind of be read as a cornerstone piece in a series of three plays that Calderon wrote during the roughly the same time period in which in all three plays, an innocent wife is incorrectly accused of adultery. Um, and in each of the plays, each of the wives make various and often, you know, very strategic attempts attempts at exculpating themselves. However, the kind of verbal agency of the wife or her linguistic dexterity falters in a substantial way in each of the plays. And so sometimes this has been understood critically as Calderon kind of upholding this, you know, these like didactic lessons for wives or, you know, that that correspond with the conduct manuals of the time of vives and things like that or you know instructions for christian women but i really think that he's critiquing this kind of double bind in which women's speech is forced or the fem the speech of the female characters is kind of um how it's how it's curtailed and how it's how it's limited because you know neither are they able to verbally exculpate themselves, nor does the silence end up as a protective gesture either. So it's a real, you know, Calderon is really bringing uh, to the fore these, how these different acts of silencing have this critical, have this really critical function. Um, you know, and then silence has this double valence continuously. And it's interesting too, because across the three plays, the, the wives have different understandings of what the silence would actually mean. Um, so, and then also I would just say in terms of kind of a disability framework also, or a medical framework rather, there's, you know, a very perverse kind of medical discussion that's going on. And so as the doctor of his honor, Gutierrez, the husband is situating himself as, you know, the agent that has to, um, 
you know, suss out the source of contamination. And I think this has to do obviously with kind of inquisitorial anxieties and the way that Calderon is staging this anxiety about blood purity and adultery and then the chastity that's forced upon, you know, the, the body of the, of the wife. But um, it's, 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 there's a capaciousness again, I keep going back to that word, but there's a kind of capaciousness to how silence is codified in these texts that I think becomes really productive to look at, particularly since the husbands get so much attention, since they are the ones whose dramatic, tragic, violent action and their, you know, obsessive jealousy. We can even think of how that ties into Othello and his jealousy, but, you know, how this obsessive um, kind of uh, anxiety is seems to be what's propelling the plot rather than you know giving any kind of importance to how the female characters are strategically utilizing their speech acts or their silence um yeah, yeah. so, so I, often I think, for us so I'm sorry to interrupt you I no, feel no, like no, I, no. our size that that um that silence and being silenced and yeah, being especially as as a woman, this the, this notion for us today of you know like a critical metaphor of the voice is a really powerful one. <laughs> and so um, so I I wonder if you could um, address the pre modern silences and um, and ask I, I guess what I want to ask is whether you find them to be aligned with um, lack of lack or maybe even loss of power for female characters like Mencia? Um, or do you find that female speech is always, or do you think that speech is equated with social agency and power, um, maybe even self-determination? <laughs> um, I just feel like um, you have this interesting way of representing Mencia's silence in your essay, in which you call it um, transform a transformation and a violent haunting. And to me, I just, I just feel like we could spend this whole talk talking about um, how her silence is at once a, a transformation and a haunting. Um, maybe is Calderon using linguistic rupture to represent a realm between speech and silence or something else? I don't know. I mean, I personally, yeah, thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, a great, a great question. But I, I mean, I think that you know, he is showing us this is an ex, this is an acerbic critique of kind of the the, the limiting ways in which um, women's speech is 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 managed, and I think it is bringing it to the fore. It's 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 bringing it to the fore for the for the other. I mean, for, even for the other characters in the play, but also then for the audience and for anybody who's reading or viewing the plays. I mean, this duplicity kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't is kind of reduces it. Um, to this 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 level where even if they did have all of the linguistic skills in the world or even if they are managing this situation very well and the the end result is the same it's kind of like the terrible machine of tragedy is going to uh, kind of override that but you know um yeah so so I I, I think that you know it's important to keep that in mind and to give attention to these moments where speech is fractured but, um, I think also just thinking that silence is negative because it's not silence can also be just a, just as much of an agential tool as speech mm -hmm. can be, I think, which is also one of the things that uh, E. Jane Burns talks about in, in, in as regards the talking back like that this should be a strategic um, or it can be a strategic moment of when you, you talk back, how you talk back and things like that. But I think yeah. that, you know, that kind of reminds me of like Cordelia and Lear and, and things like that. Um, I don't know if, I know, you know, you you work quite a bit on, on King Lear. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on your thoughts on that. Oh, well, um, I, yeah, I, I feel like we could probably um, in a way uh, talk about a lot of silences um, in early modern drama. Um, I think that um, Lear, I've written on Lear and how um, Cordelia is a great example of a female character's silence that is anything but uh, particularly obedient. You know, I think there are really familiar discourses of silence, uh, certainly um, early modern culture and drama, but um, about 
you know, the traditional <laughs> view of female silence is aligning it with um, chastity, aligning it with obedience to proper, and that is male authorities. But if we see characters like Cordelia refuse to answer um, when prompted to speak, or shall we say coerced to speak, <laughs> um, and when Lear demands that she speak and she says nothing, 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 she insists that yeah. she will not answer, mm -hmm. um, that silence, I think, can actually open up space spaces of agency, um, certainly spaces where there are multiple possible meanings that can coexist, mm -hmm. um, because certainly a silent daughter can be read as obedient and as chaste, but it also is extraordinarily resistant <laughs> to authority. If someone says, tell me how much you love me, and you say, I utterly <laughs> refuse that, <laughs> I utterly refuse that. Um, and certainly also um, Queen Elizabeth I um, has many instances of insisting, like she actually coins a phrase and answer answerless. Um, and she frequently evokes silence as this positive um, practice that she she herself learned about as a child. <laughs> she says, she, she talks about, she makes classical references about um, philosophers reciting over their alphabet before they even will speak a reply so that you can have enough time to have a deeply considered response. So it's very intellectual, it's reason, it's consideration, but it's also expanding your scope um, to say yes or no later <laughs> um, to these marriage proposals or to say, um, I'm just gonna give you no answer now, but we'll wait and see what plural um, possibilities exist in the future, so. Uh, yeah, certainly she can be aligned with Isabella at the end of Measure for Measure, that the no answer is an answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just, um, I just feel like the silences can, um, can join the positive and the negative connotations. Um, did you also find this to be true in the, the moments where a wife murder is happening, about to happen, <laughs> um, or where there's something about the silence that is rhetorical um, in any, in, or in some other text, I don't know, but um, I know your work on the, the, the wife murder is, I think is tied in here. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I th of, of course, I think silence and speech are both uh, rhetorical and, and strategic. Um, yeah, I, I wonder if that, you know, ties into what you were saying earlier, too, about, you know, dance's legibility as a type of silent rhetoric that can be communicated corporeally rather than verbally. Um, you know, and I wonder, maybe that's due to some of my own limitations, or maybe I should even think about language in a more, you know, in a, in a, in a broader way. But I guess when I'm thinking about language in these texts, I'm often thinking about forms of communication that are rendered more tan tangibly too. So like a mm -hmm. written text or a published play or a novel. And, you know, one of the aspects of your work that I think maybe ties on this like rhetorical use of silence, um, but, you know, regards kind of the ephemerality of discourse and so both the ephemerality of the spoken word that can that can dissipate and then kinetic discourse and how um you know i think in in one of your articles you kind of parse kinetic discourse and the different etymological significances that that can have um have i have i gotten that right yeah i think so i think that um what i the way i'd like to respond is just to talk about the way that a movement and you know a performed movement in space is ephemeral and um and just as an enacted silent it's just you know it's very easy to overlook it as a um an, a unit of signification i guess you could say in the broadest possible terms but um but i think that one way i'd like to i i like to talk about um choreography is the need for repetition um and so the the various types of travel and dance and so forth um and ritual that i'm talking about have a repeated element to them it's not just a one time uh pathway that everyone is tracing um and so because of that ephemerality um there's a need to re-evoke that feeling that lived and embodied feeling of this is who I am this is what gives meaning to my relationality to everyone else in this in this quote unquote dance and so um so I mean if you look to um Homi Baba and his um notion of what it means to other um 
there's a really wonderful aspect to that that talks about fetishization and also just the need the need um, for obsessive repetition <laughs> in the process of othering. Um, and um, so anyway, yeah, Baba talks about the need for this constant re-evocation of that moment of departure, that moment of establishing difference of between you and me and you and me. And so, um, so there's, yeah, there's often in the sense of creating racialized difference or gender difference. And certainly I'm sure this also um, can tie into your work on disability studies. With well, the moment you're establishing a difference that, that matters in terms of power, um, you have to stage it over and over and over again. Otherwise it doesn't stay real. <laughs> and so to keep that ideology, to keep that belief system going, um, a lot of times you have to dance these rituals, um, whether that's in church or on the stage um, uh, or in, in each, each version of your community, um, you have to reestablish those patterns, whether that's of servitude um, or whether that's of, um, of, that's of community and and who we are um, showing reverence and honor to. Yeah, so absolutely. Um, <laughs> but I guess thinking of community, I'd love to hear, you know, I think maybe we could wrap it up there because I could talk to you about this, about many of these issues for, you know, a very long time, but I'd love to hear if we have questions and if not, I have qu more questions for you, but I'm, sh I'm sure we yes. might have in the audience. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can do. move to the Q and A. This is fantastic and and a wonderful way to to think about the intersections between your work and the interplay uh, therein. But uh, so this is pretty informal. We'll open it up to questions. If you want to pop on, uh, you know, and and ask your question, or if you're more comfortable posting the question in the chat, that would be a, a fine way of doing it as well. So yeah, make sure I can see the chat. And if you want to use the raise hand feature too, that might be easier. I'm inclined to give a quick moment to let them, but um, maybe to get you all started in a very general sense, uh, you you brought up that that embody talk. There's an invitation to be radical within the text, which really struck me, right? And I. I you can be as broad or as specific as you'd like, but how, how does this look like within your approaches to the literature, this idea of, of being radical within the text? Hmm. Elisa, do you want to? <laughs> I'm trying to think of the perfect example, but, um, but that's funny the way it kind of brings me into um, moments in the classroom where I think it's very tempting to, um, believe what the, you know, believe what you're told. <laughs> um, especially when you're encountering a pre-modern text that is perhaps canonical, that um, that presents itself as knowing all the answers and um, that you don't have to believe it. So if you know, say there's a woman that may very clearly be presented um, on the surface as a victim, I think that we can ask ourselves um, whether or not that's true. Do we believe, are we, you know, so it, I mean, I think it's just a way of saying that it's, it's always good to think about reading with the grain and against the grain. So um, yeah, so definitely if we have, um, yeah, so if we have movement, I, I, like to think about different motivations for the movement and the motivation for a movement may not be the one that the characters are saying. So um, I was talking earlier with, with Alani about the end of the Taming of the Shrew <laughs> and <laughs> the way that there's a sort of dance of obedience for the three wives, the brand new wives, who's going to be the most obedient? And it, you know, I think that we have to question what is the real real, what is real, but <laughs> that we have to question what the motivation is for those movements of scurrying or not to your husband to, to make this extravagant show of obedience. Um, and you can read that as a sincere expression of, I run to you to show my service to you, or you can read it as a manipulation of the discourse of expected wifely, you know, uh, wifely you know dancing of a choreography of service uh, which Catherine pr prompts us to to question 
Yeah, that's that's so that's super interesting. And I guess I Ruben to answer your question a little bit, I would say that, you know, one of the things that uh, E. Jane Burns talks about, which I which I really appreciate, but I think this is also where I have, some, you know, some 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 issue with how it's framed. Um, but, you know, she talks about the institutional positioning of academic women over the years, too, and how, you know, our voices as teachers or readers or interpreters of texts can be, I think she says, like, both our own and simultaneously constructed by like institutional pressures and things like that. And she's really drawing attention to the double positionality of, and like the split subjectivity um, of these, what she calls stereotyped uh, female subjects. And obviously the context that she's talking with is primarily old French and medieval French literary texts. But, you know, I was thinking both, you know, the way that I, I, I and, and I'm also thinking kind of simultaneously about that, that this really, powerful article that I read, I think it was just yesterday, it just came out, um, Farah Karim Cooper's Breaking into the All-White Academy. And it's, you know, about, um, you know, being one of the few ethnic minority Shakespeare, Shakespeare professors, and just what positionality and what, what, what radicality kind of means in the classroom, or even by, you know, being represented in the classroom, or having a voice represented in the classroom. And the question of race is completely not in the actual text of E. Jane Burns's body talk, but I think, you know, in all of my classes, personally by kind of centering issues of gender, centering disability studies, centering race. I think that's one of the ways to kind of both open up these field, you know, open up these fields for the students and to also help them have different, you know, broader uh, dialogues. Mm -hmm. Oh, I couldn't agree more. Um, can, that's great. Yeah. Shall I, shall I go, shall I read aloud the, the comment? from the chat. Sure, you, you want me to read it? I can read it. Okay. Um, hi, Cameron. Perfect. I'm sorry, I have so many boxes on my screen, I can't see you, but I saw your talk and it was awesome. So, <laughs> so thank you for that one. <laughs> um, but um, Cameron McNabb writes, thank you so much for uh, so much to our fellows. This question is for Elisa. Your comment about the repetition of choreography makes me wonder how that concept might apply to the choreography, the repetitive movements of the theater production, blocking, fighting, et cetera. And how do you think that kinetic embodiment affects the relationship between an actor's identity and the role they repetitively occupy? I think that's just such a, such a wonderful question. And I, there's so many different ways that we could approach this, but also, um, yeah, I think that I, it made me think of Keith Hamilton Cobb and the way that he talks about the um, the impact of entering a role such as Othello with his own real life self, and you know, there's an exhaustion to it. There's a physical exhaustion to repetitive acting of a role, and also emotional exhaustion when it's a role that it, you know that taxes um, your sense of who you are today. Um, as opposed to entering into a past that where there's just incredibly toxic um, discourses of race and that you are physically tracing those with your body. So um, all I can say is uh, um, that actors must um, need to compensate for this kind of um, exhaustion with, um, with care and care work um, for themselves and for each other. Um, because we certainly, um, if we're talking about plays like El Medico <laughs> and Othello, we're asking actors um, and actors of all abilities to come into a space where um, what they're moving through with their bodies are horrendous um, discourses of, um, of disempowerment and murder and so forth. So, <laughs> Um, Alani, would you like to um, address any aspects of repetitive um, performance in any way? I was actually thinking that um, within the lyric tradition, there's it seems like there's a great deal of repetition, um, just this iteration of certain types of bodies and certain types of body parts, certain perhaps even rhetorical moves that get re repeated and repeated. So is it always the same <laughs> or is it not? Um, I think it's, it's all, it's probably maybe always different <laughs> rather than, rather than always the same. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Okay. Um, so there's another question in the chat um, and, and here asks, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. I really like both of your discussions of body talk 
and speech silence as forms of power and the contradictory form of these ideas. And I was hoping to hear a little bit more about your thoughts on these two forms, hoping that it really makes sense. Um, of speech and silence. I think, I think those are the two. Oh, Alani, you have more examples than we have time for, but why don't you lead us off <laughs> with uh, speech and silence? I'm um, sorry, I'm just taking a look at the question too. Yeah, thank you so much, Nahir, for your for your question. Um, I guess I I I, I kind of <laughs> I, I'd love to know a little bit more about uh, what you mean about the contradictory form, like if if you mean specific specific forms. Um, but I would just say, you know, one of the I don't know, I suppose like critical angles I think that are 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 really important in discussions of speech and you know kind of the verbal register and then the corporeal register are is precisely kind of around this question of spectacularity but also how how all of these um priorities come to the fore in in, in one way or another so i mean i think that's a a bit of a vague a vague answer but i mean you know how this how silencing, but also how speech, I mean, I think it's maybe inherently paradoxical, but how they can be aligned with specifically with disempowerment or how language can have a specifically a gentle role or how a body and it's, you know, a gentle movement um, can can communicate something even when language isn't there is probably um, how how I'd go about answering that. Can I dovetail on that? Just you talked about movement as well. And I, I wonder, you know, thinking about speech and silence, how does stillness factor into, you know, stasis factor into your 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 work on that, Elisa? I think um Alani was prodding me about that very thing. <laughs> um it, that um that exactly um her her question for me um that she, you know, sort of said, but what about stasis and is the is immobility then a kind of resistance is that a kind of protest um and especially if you're in a situation where someone is um coercing you to perform the the choreography of servitude um certainly slow walking and also certainly immobility um can can resist those discourses that want you to work <laughs> for um whatever authority figure is is causing you to move but um but also i i i think that silence and also possibly um stasis could also be seen as a as a space of rest and of um strategy and of you know absorbing and reflecting reflection um I don't know, um, Alani, do you have another thought about this? I feel like a lot of times in our day-to-day, um, -day, um, at least digital lives, that we're expected to have very quick responses to things. And sometimes there is a moment of silence that um, is deserved <laughs> or immobility that is deserved and is necessary. Um, but I don't know, um, would you like to take that in a different direction? <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, I would, just, yeah, <laughs> think I don't have anything to comment about our digital lives. I think, I okay, no, no. But, but, but I would say that, you know, I'm really, I was so struck by one of the, one of the lines of the Tempest that you drew out in one of your articles, which is that like the come forth and being, you know, somebody being incited to quick motion. So this like rapidity and, you know, the velocity that is kind of conjured up therein. And it really made me think of this really wonderful poem. I really love Robert Herrick. And I I don't get an opportunity to talk about him or work on him at all really that often, but he has this poem, The Hot Cart, in which, you know, it, it, it starts off, come son, sons of summer by whose toil, you know, we are the lords of wine and oil or something like that. And we have this multiple kind of interpolative strategy where it's the sons of summer who are the ones doing the labor. And he's really emphasizing the labor that they're doing to kind of to sustain the this himself and the other kind of, um, people who are not laborers in the poem who are the lords of wine and oil. So there's always, you know, like, what does interpolation mean? And I mean, I think Althusser is really interesting uh, to think about in, in, in that regard. And although obviously he has a really tragic story with his wife and, you know, there's a situation of wife murder there too. But um, yeah, yeah I, I would really <laughs> think about the interpolative kind of strategies and what kind of dynamic when you're even asking somebody to to speak, then it you know it, it, it whether they respond or not. I mean, there's there's 
um, kind of a projection and a virtuality of what of 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 what is expected of them. Yeah, and I also think that within a disability studies um, lens, you want to think about who is inciting whom to motion and to what kind of able-bodied motion. Mm -hmm. Are there certain preset expectations for patterns of movement that are being imposed on us, even just by the shape of the world we live in, you know, the way that, you know, the way that um, our buildings and our, our world is constructed. Um, I also think that sometimes, yeah, that imagine you know, if you are expected to be most free in serving God, like in Milton or the Book of Common Prayer, as um, Urvashi Shankarvarti has shown us, you know, that you're most free when you are serving incessantly, incessantly serving freely, apparently, um, that stasis, stasis could be something, an immobility could be something actually to look for and to question or to, you know, if you have that radical sensibility, that stasis could actually be a very positive action, action in and of itself of resistance. Mm -hmm. well, here, here's two radical sensibilities. Um, thank you both for being radical in your thoughts and your thoughtfulness in this uh, talk. This has uh, been really generative and wonderful. I hope you're seeing some of the love in the in the chat. Uh, I agree with Jonathan Shu, who says you should both be on a po podcast. This was incredible, but thank you so much. Uh, and thank you all for joining us uh, today for this, this conversation. And you can find it up on YouTube soon-ish. All right. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Oh, thank, thank you, you everyone who attended. Thank you.